Favorite song? Soft and Wet by the artist formerly known as Prince. Who's your favorite rock star? Prince. I mean, we had our problems here and there. Lenny brought me a track with the lyrics written, and then I came in and changed the things that I wanted to change vocally mm -hmm. or lyrically, and then did, you know, my version of it. When Lenny Kravitz brought me the song, I didn't know anything about yeah. the fact that he had worked with Ingrid Chavez. I mean, I was completely innocent. Prince hears it on the radio, and he calls me up, and he says, uh, Ingrid, what's up with that Madonna song? I know that's you. The original script for Graffiti Bridge was me, Prince, and Madonna. And uh, Prince flew Madonna out to pay for the part. Either originally we were going to do a musical together, and we were going to write the music for it, and that didn't really pan out. Uh, and we'd gotten together a couple of times, you know, in the hopes of working with each other. And some Madonna didn't like the script, and Prince was telling her, well, I'm still writing it. They started arguing, and then they started writing on each other. He, I, he seemed to fight the idea of just writing songs for a record together, because he's done that with so many people. Well, Madonna said the script sucked. Madonna drove Prince crazy, and they were arguing and talking about the script. Then they started talking about each other's shoes. Prince, look at your shoes, with cowboy boot shoes. Then she goes to Prince, look at your shoes with those peace signs and zippers. And Two big egos. You know what I mean? We just kept getting together. And so Madonna said to Prince, I'm going to leave. It's too cold in Minneapolis. Sad because Prince had planned it, a party for Madonna. But Madonna was ready to go. But what Prince decided to do was like, let's have dinner. Prince's chef made food for Madonna and Prince. When Madonna got there, she saw all these candles, and she said, what are we having, a seance or something? And they never ate the food, and then she told Prince that she wanted to leave, but before she left, they recorded that song, Like a Prayer, and it was another song they recorded together. And Love Song was one of the songs, and I just said, you know, this is crazy. It's such a great song. Why, why not put it on the record? And... Um, it seemed to relate just because it's about a relationship that, that's, you know, a hate-love relationship. And so he agreed to it, and we kind of sent the tapes back and forth to each other, and we keep building it. It was like he would write a sentence, and I would add on to it, and then send it back to him, and he would continue the story, you know, basically. It was fun. And then she left. I think that um, Prince lives a very isolated life, and I don't, and that is the big difference between us, and I just try to be a positive influence on him. I've always been a fan. I think he's incredible, and I also admire him. He's very courageous, and he causes lots of controversy, too, which is great, and I think he is a brilliant musician. Interesting. Well, we'll look forward to hearing from you tonight at 10. Maybe you can talk to Prince. December 1st, 1987, on a Tuesday night. That's when that all happened and changed. An interesting night, totally unexpected. I got a famous night. One Tuesday night, I went alone. That Tuesday night's Williams Pub had funk night. <laughs> the prince walked in. He kept looking at me, and there was just something sad in his eyes. He sent him a note. Hi, remember me? Smile, I love it when you smile. He invited me over and he asked me what my name was. I said Gertrude. He said his name was Dexter. And um, then he asked me if I wanted to take a drive to Paisley Park. And I said, okay. That night, I was at his house in Chad So we took a drive there. I sat in the front seat and he sat in the back seat. We got to Paisley Park and he put me in this room. I think it was just a room with some candles. Let me just see what you can do. And I was like, okay. And I had no idea what I was going to do. I was just writing. And when he finally came to pick me up, he said, Kat, I met this girl. She's so beautiful. Her name is Gertrude. Ingrid Chavez was at Paisley Park recording. He had left her at Paisley Park in Studio A to record her poetry. A few months after we parted ways, he pulled me out to, um, to Paisley Park at midnight. I met Susan Rogers. He disappeared. I didn't know where he was. And I told Prince, why did you leave her at Paisley Park by herself? And so I got on the phone with her, and I said, hi, Gertrude. And she said, hi. I don't really remember it that clearly. So I told him to go back to the studio. Played some little percussive instruments and created a couple of songs. And I think he thought I was pretty weird when he heard them. There was backwards vocals and all kind of crazy stuff. After that, he said that we were going to the studio and record them. That same night, he went to Paisley Park and started recording Love Sexy. You know, that was the kind of the beginning of a... A very creative period in both of our lives. I wanted to make it about an experience that changed me. 
made me think differently about what I wrote, why I wrote, how I acted towards people. You know, he was beginning to question, you know, his own spirituality and God and love and his type relationship. We were both just in the spiritual, creative space. I spent a lot of time just hanging out at Pace of Park. I make music all the time, and I, I love music. I love making music, the creation of it. It was really just a three-month period, and it was winter, in a snow cave or something for three months where it was just me and him. I'm writing, and he's writing, and we're talking, and we're sharing, and I'm writing him letters and poems. He's writing these songs and having me come listen to every one. Every time he records something, it's like, listen to this one, listen to this one. It was moving so fast. There's some songs that I've done that people have told me, well, I feel like I want to make love. I feel sexy when I listen to this. If I could convey this feeling somehow, there's no words to describe how important that is to me when I do something. When I came into his life, it inspired him to begin writing about it and, and finding a way to express what he was going through. As an artist, you know, sometimes you just want something to come along and crack it open again for you because you're, you're stuck. So I guess that's what I did. The prince that I knew from that winter, he was in creative mode. We're going to take everything that we can from this moment and we're going to put it to music. All this happened really quick. We were very much inspired by each other and it was special. And then when it was over, it was over. It was like, okay, I'm going on tour now. But, you know, after that, it was kind of like, like, okay, I guess that was that. Met him in December, February, March. I don't even know if we even hung out much after that. You know, we actually wound up not talking for, like, a couple of years after that. And then, like, getting together and finishing the record and then making a movie and then not talking again. Okay, and are we going to see some new music from Vanity? I know you're working on some new music. Yes, certainly so. will. Um, Tony Lamont and Jesse Johnson, Mary Terry and Jimmy Jam are producing the next, uh, my next um, <laughs> when, when we, record. <laughs> so when, when will we see the album? Um, probably later on this year. Sheila E. told Prince about us. Uh, yeah, I guess she was scouting. <laughs> Romeo Blue. That's the Romeo Blue phase. Oh, the thing on Soul Train? So I did that show. That was just for Soul Train. I was making my demos at a and A lot of the gear that it takes to make the record sound like what we want it to sound like, it's very hard to find. Mm -hmm. I'm really looking for a certain sound, mm -hmm. a real whole pure sound. Tony and I went to junior high school together. His name was Tony Fortier. Tony was the partner I'd been looking for. I hadn't seen him in a few years. He'd grown his hair out and looked like a rock star. We started making music together and he was kind of on this thing, it was funky. Tony was raw. If I played you these demos, I mean, they were nasty, nasty funk. It was like where I went with Let Love Rule, but it was more on the funk side. And I was playing a lot of his instruments on demos. We were working on material that featured him. There was always an undercurrent of competition coming from Tony. Then came Sonia. Sonia was irresistible. She met Tony. Tony and Sonia hopped on his bike to grab food. Well, they didn't return that night. I didn't think in a million years that Tony would steal my girl, but he did. I was heartbroken. Tony and I stuck together. I hung in with him. We did a showcase well, somewhere in the valley. I played bass. Tony sang lead. We did the showcase. For, I guess Prince sent Sheila. Prince signed Tony, who wanted me to be part of the deal. Remember Tony telling me that Prince said that they didn't sound like records to him. He wanted them to be more polished. They ended up signing. I went my own way to go do my stuff. I turned it down. Is Tony, is that how you met Ingrid Chavez? Because they Did were dating. At, they were dating at one point, weren't they? That Tony and Prince had a falling out because of, yeah. over her. Yeah. That I, 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 yeah. I don't want to speak for her, but yeah. So there was like about a year and a half time between us recording the original tracks for the poetry album and finishing the album. Tony and I became really close. We were boyfriend and girlfriend. You know, being there, we would all hang out and we would go to the studio late at night and do background vocals on his record. And But it wasn't like Prince was involved with my life at the time. That was just an interesting period in time. You know? Tony Lamont's here. That may have been the first project we had when I took the label over. She and her co-star are still what Hollywood calls an item. I'm going to get kicked if I don't ask you about Alec Baldwin. What do you want to know? Are you nuts about each other? We're nuts about each other. That's uh, funny. You're nuts about him? Yep. So something good came out of the marrying man. Huh? Oh, that's what it's all about. Because she was supposed to be directing. See, it's everything's timing. There was a reason for the marrying man, and I guess that was it. I got to give her a lot of respect for it. So it's kind of like, nope, and I don't blame her. That's and funny. she took the scripts.
These in the temple. When they first began to conceptualize Graffiti Bridge, I think that these were the characters. The original script for Graffiti Bridge was me, Prince, and Madonna. Originally, we were going to do a musical together, and we were going to write the music for it, and that didn't really pan out. I was kind of looking forward to Graffiti Bridge, but Madonna dropped out. And then he got Ingrid and whoever else. Everything turned into chaos. I think Camille was going to be a character in the movie, but that was dropped. Instead of the character being named Angel, it was named Aura. Kim Basinger, she was in the script. Then one day Kim was gone and (laughs) Ingrid was there. I had never acted. I was nervous about it. Well, let's see. I had met Prince a few years earlier. I had made this record with him that hadn't been released. This is a few years later. And, you know, we actually wound up not talking for a couple of years after that and then sitting together and finishing the record and then making a movie. I think that it was because of you that I got the part in Graffiti Bridge. Ingrid and I, well, we go back. Prince said, I know this girl. You should actually meet her. She's a real poet. She's really the real deal. And go meet her and talk to her and then come back and tell me what you think. And so we met. You were living off of Nicollet Avenue on like the third floor or something like this. And I mean, usually he was looking for radio friendly kind of people who had that. And she was really a poet and an, and an artist, and which was not typical of, of the artist that he was looking at. And so I came back and I said, you know, yeah, she's the real deal. I got a call from Prince. He asked me if I wanted to finish the poetry album. Which we start working on the poetry album. We start making videos. And Craig Rice shot the first video, Heaven Must Be Near. Heaven Must Be Near, I shot that, and directed that, and shot the video, which Prince actually edited, which I thought he did a great job. It took too long, but he did, he did a great job. But when they went to start looking for a lead for the role of Aura, Craig told Prince, you have Aura here, like, why are you looking anywhere else, so? When we got to Graffiti Bridge, I said, we need to put her in the movie. Even before my record was released, I went into the studio with many Kravitz and recorded just by my lap. You saw it all over her. I'm still standing next to her and I'm talking, have a full conversation. She was really nice, but I was like, maybe I'm bucking her. Eventually I walked away. I'm on stage shooting now a scene. And then I watch Prince walk over to her and she does the same thing. <laughs> she wasn't impressed by nothing any of us was well, doing. That's true. When I got back into the scene, I was kind of over it. You know, like, okay, I'm going to do this movie. You know, Warner Brothers having some kind of input on, you know, like what they thought was going to make a good film or not. It wasn't, you know, sticking with what they originally had decided this film was going to be about. I think it came down to editing and Prince was changing the script along the way. But I think that he wanted to make a musical, which is something he was trying to say, you know, about love and God and peace and people getting together and getting along, things like that. Sometimes his shooting day was different because he was always adding new stuff. I relate very much to that character. She sort of has to be sacrificed at the end, sort of. Yes. It's just the feeling that it is a sacrifice. Writing and laying your soul on the line is a sacrifice. The story of my life. <laughs> I'll tell you how I met Lenny, filming Graffiti Bridge. And after finishing up work that day, Prince asked me if I wanted to go see Lenny play at First Avenue. He had a limo drive us to First Avenue and we're just there hanging out. And we hung out at the soundboard and watched for a little bit. It's halfway through Lenny's set and Prince is like, yeah, boy, let's go. I want to go home now. Lenny wasn't even done yet. So we get in the limo. We drive all the way back to Paisley Park. At the time, I lived literally like five minutes from First Avenue. And he gets out of the car and he tells the driver to take me home. And I'm like, can you just take me back to First Avenue? So I went back to First Avenue and I went backstage. She came to some of my early gigs, but I don't remember the day I met her. Like, was that a gig or was that a... Lenny and I had a mutual friend, Tony Lamas. Um... We met, I don't, I'm not sure if it was through Tony or just her coming to a gig. Um, yeah. I never met met Lenny, but I was friends with Tony and I knew that him and Lenny were friends. So just talked to Lenny and told him, you know, I'm a friend of Tony's. And so we talked and hung out for a little while and we became friends. So whenever I was out in LA, we would hang out. I had just come off the road from the Let Love Rule tour. I was nobody. I was the kid, new kid on the block. And when I would go out to LA for to pick up some of the shots for the movie, I would hang out with Lenny. And- she was here shooting the movie, and then we were in LA editing and mixing and all that for the movie. Then the song was written <laughs> a few months down the line when I was in Los Angeles. I sort of just booked myself in a studio just to do some things, and it came out. <laughs> Him and Andre Betts were in the studio, and he invited me to the studio, and Zoe was just a little girl, and I was coloring with her. Lenny Kravitz and 
myself and a guy named Andre Betts went in the studio. They asked me if I had anything. I said, I have this letter that I wrote on me. So I just went in and read the letter. Dre Bet started to beat, Lenny did some strings, and I did all the vocal and, and the lyric. And then a couple of days later, Lenny invited me to go to Virgin to um, talk to the head of Virgin and let them hear this song. I had a cassette of the song. The head of Virgin asked me if he could have my copy. Oh, can... um. I really like this song. Can I, can I hold on to your cassette? Must have heard that this was a song Madonna should do, but can, can I have a copy? I was like, oh yeah, sure. Thinking I will get another copy. When I actually tried to contact the studio and talk, contact people about getting another copy, it was like shut down. <laughs> when I gave Justify My Love to Madonna, I called her and I said, I have a number one song for you. Unfortunately, he said that he did it all and me and Dre were sort of left out of the picture pretty much. And I brought it to her and she heard it and she liked it. And we recorded it two days later. Lenny gives a song to Madonna. They record it without my permission. Oh, she's the one who uh, laid the track, you know? <laughs> well, I mean, we had our problems here and there. Lenny brought me a track with the lyrics written, and then I came in and changed the things that I wanted to change vocally mm -hmm. or lyrically, and then did, you know, my version of it. When Lenny Kravitz brought me the song, I didn't know anything about no. the fact that he had worked with Ingrid Chavez. I mean, I was completely innocent in this situation. Yeah. Love song, it's such a great song just because it's about a relationship that's, you know, a hate love relationship. It seemed to relate. They had dated. Originally, we were going to do a musical together and we were going to write the music for it, and that didn't really pan out. Prince told me that he originally wanted Kim Basinger, but she turned it down. They broke up. She was supposed to be the lead in Graffiti Bridge. He gave it to Ingrid, who was also his previous girlfriend. Ingrid went out with my old friend Lenny Kravitz from high school. Tony and I went to junior high school together. His name was Tony Fortier. He'd grown his hair out and looked like a rock star. We started making music together. Prince signed Tony. Tony and I became really close. We were boyfriend and girlfriend. So it was just too much. It was like touching in so many areas. The song comes out. I haven't told anyone. And I've signed a non-disclosure. I've made an agreement with Lenny. You wrote Justify Your Love for, for Madonna. It was a collaboration between the two of us, and it, it sort of started off in my studio and ended up in hers. We, we worked really hard. And then all of a sudden it was like number one all over the world. It was kind of a shock. This is ABC News Nightline. Reporting from New York, Forrest Sawyer. Has Madonna finally gone too far? Well, I back. only have a few minutes. Half of me thought that I was going to get away with it. The other half thought, you no, know, with the wave of conservatism that is sweeping over the nation, there was going to be a problem. A video is the filmic expression of the song. A woman is talking to her lover and she's saying, I'm not afraid of who you are. These feelings exist. There are a lot of people in the industry who have said it was all a kind of publicity stunt. This is one of the best self-marketers in the business. We have never really seen anything like it. MTV, they rejected it completely. Now, for the first time, the channel has decided to take a pass on a clip by pop music's hottest star. When we decided, hell, let's sell it. What Madonna did was brilliant. I admire her so much. I never got to communicate with her about the song ever. And I haven't spoken to her in years. When I met her, she was completely different than the music. So without knowing her now, I do not know her now. I can't really speak about her music without knowing how she really is. Where I kind of agreed that I wouldn't tell anyone that I wrote the song, so I didn't even tell Prince. Prince hears it on the radio and he calls me up and he says, uh, Ingrid, what's up with that Madonna song? I know that's you. I had never told anyone. It was just between me and Lenny. So I admitted to him on the phone. I was, I was like, yeah, you're right. I recorded this song and I, and I made an agreement with Lenny that I wouldn't tell anyone. He said, are you stupid? You have a record coming out and people are going to think that you are copying Madonna. I was so surprised that he could hear it so clearly that I had written that song, even though I had never told him. He was so mad at me. It was kind of obvious to know which were her ideas as opposed to what we were going to get. What they had before was so much better and richer. Kim Basinger and Prince had written a script. I thought that it would have been a very elevated, almost like a Vim Vendors concept with the angels, the dark right. and the light concept. I thought that his stupidity was the reason that he did up basically. So yeah, I was really pissed off about it. Very, very much so. After watching it 
you get the feeling when Prince got bored with editing it. Man, you know, boy, she's out of there. Ambulance came, took her right off. So that's how his mind worked too. Like, okay, move it right along. Prince, the enigmatic and elusive king of punk rock, was in New York last week for the world premiere of his fourth movie, Graffiti Bridge. The night of the premiere of Graffiti Bridge, he knew that I was there. Lenny came, had me come out to his car, and that's when he told me basically that Madonna was going to do it. He talked me into not taking credit for it. I just felt a little bit cornered about the whole deal. I didn't have a lawyer, I didn't have management at the time, so. Craig Rice had heard the original. You are the only person who's ever heard the original version mm -hmm. of Justify My Love. Justify My Love, which she recorded. I thought it was a brilliant piece of work. A singer and actress, Ingrid Chavez, claimed that she originally wrote Justify My Love for Madonna and recorded it with Lenny Kravitz in Los Angeles last summer. But there has been a further twist to the tale. Lenny Kravitz has responded to the claim by Graffiti Bridge star Ingrid Chavez, saying that Chavez did write some lyrics for the song and that he signed an agreement with her, giving her 25% of the composer's royalties. However, for undisclosed personal reasons, the agreement also stipulated that Kravitz would get sole writer's credit. I didn't tell Prince because I was actually wasn't supposed to tell anybody that I wrote the song because I kind of got myself into a situation with Lenny. He did give me something, but it wasn't credit. You know? Can you catch any heat from Lisa? So, no, no, no. She and I are cool. We know it's. Well, I'm single again. That was a big change. The last two years have been sort of a recovery period, spending time with my kid. Do you and the baby hang out with Mr. Kravitz and spend time together, the three of you, every now and then? <laughs> I haven't really seen anyone in a long time. You know, I just have gone through lots of changes. So. Who are you dating now, Lanny? Before uh, we get to the music, who are you a, dating now? I'm a, I'm a, I'm a single guy. Man. My brother. I don't do, I don't. Yeah, you don't do. <laughs> yeah, that's what Lisa found out. You don't do. Yeah, honey. Okay, I'll tell you what. Then why don't you just look at these divorce papers I'm issuing to you? <laughs> why don't you go look at a different apartment? <laughs> Lenny was involved for a while with this woman who was, I think, Hispanic. Yeah. And then she was the woman that was sort of involved with Madonna. Oh, yo, in, in whoa, whoa. Chavez? Who the hell That's is Baba this? That's Baba Booey. You guys know. <laughs> see, uh, uh, Ingrid Chavez. Well, you worked with Madonna on that song. Yes, ma'am. Is that where you met her? <laughs> How long do you generally stay with these girls? What's the average? Like oh, a my, month? About five minutes. About five, five minutes, minutes is right. Well, yeah, it was a nasty battle. It was playing out on, you know, MTV, you know, like statements that going back between me and Lenny, and it was really just ugly. That was when I hired a lawyer. Oh, I took Lenny to court because he had most of the copyright on it and the publishing, songwriting credit and everything. Madonna changed one line. She got 10% got credit for it. My name is on the record now as a writer and I own part of the publishing. I don't walk around in sexy clothes and I don't do sexy videos and I, you know, I don't do all that stuff, but I'm sure that if that's what I wanted, that's what Prince would probably promote. That was, that was just an interesting period in time, you know. Tony and I like, became really close friends and actually, like, boyfriend and girlfriend for a short period of time. And I think that, that probably was a lot of the reason why his record got dropped, to be honest. Cool. See, I was there for all of that recording. Being there, we would all hang out and we would go to the go to the studio late at night and you know do background vocals or whatever on his record and he was a he was a really sweet person but it wasn't like prince was involved with my life at the time so it was you know um he's just that way though he just doesn't want you know just wants to keep everybody separated <laughs> With Tony Lamont, the, the, the sad part, other than the fact that he died in a motorcycle accident, was that he died in debt to Paisley Park for like 200 grand because he was remaking that record. Yes. Wow. Wow. He was never going to he was never going to get out from under that not, unless that record went like mega mega, you know? The artist who had the best chance of going all the way was Tony Lamont. Levi was involved in producing Tony Lamont's first record. He was kind of on this thing. It was funky. Tony was raw. If I played you these demos, I mean, they were nasty, nasty funk. It was like where I went with Let Love Rule, but it was more on the funk side. 
Levi was like, man, you should have heard what, what we did with Tony. He said, man, that was gypsy funk. He would have beat Lenny to the punch and it would have been funky. And it would have been more R&B than that. They worked on the record with Tony and then they finally let Prince hear it. He's like, Mm-mm, you're not putting this out. Uh-uh. <laughs> You're not gonna have me fighting my own my own imprint. He finished his finished his solo record. I thought he had. They made Tony go back to the drawing board with David Gamson from Scritty right. Politic. Prince sent him back to the drawing board, and he spent whatever money on top of what he had spent. He was forced to remake that record. When I left, my record got dropped. I mean, just like. There was, yeah, he was vindictive on it. Came out, but, out, but they but it stopped kinda, promoting. Yeah, it right, just kind of came yeah, out. And because just, uh, yeah, you yeah. can't leave. Carmen Electra arrived. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I was replaced. Million dollars and nobody still cared.